I don't think that Isayama is a Nazi. I don't think that he is a fascist. I don't think that the show is pro-fascist, and I don't think that the show is pro-nationalism. In fact, a lot of the show's core themes and plot points serve as a direct counter to the argument that it is. However, the show is still implicitly anti-Semitic. Now, I understand that that's a heavy accusation, and it's not one that I say lightly, especially after thinking about the ending of the manga. But I do ask that in this video, that you just hear me out. As a fan of Attack on Titan, I have seen all of the online criticism lobbed at Attack on Titan and its creator, Hajime Isayama. Now, some of this criticism is fair, some of it is plain lazy, and some of it tries to warp the narrative in a way that aligns with their preconceived notions. And I think what stopped a lot of people from critiquing Attack on Titan is the need to defend themselves from people who would try to paint them as something that they're not. With all of that being said, I promise that in this critique of Attack on Titan, I will be fair to the creator, to the source material, and to you as fans of the show, myself included. But in return, I ask that you try to look at things from a new perspective. So, let's peer through the looking glass together. What is the difference between something that's explicit and implicit? Let's, let's do a hypothetical. Let's say that you and I have a mutual friend and his name is Dave. And you and I hate Dave. We talk about how much we hate him, his voice, his walk. He's just the worst person that you and I both know. And then one day I hand you a gun and I say, shoot Dave in the face. Now that is an explicit message. There's no way that those words can be construed in a way that means something other than that I want you to shoot Dave in the face. But what if instead of saying that, I said, hey, it'd be crazy if someone shot Dave. And then coincidentally, I glance over at a gun that's on a nearby table. Now I never said that you should kill Dave. In fact, I never said anything. I just laid out the circumstances necessary for you to do that if you wanted to. And yet, you would understand exactly what I meant. As it relates to media, explicit messages are ones that are clearly outlined by writers, while implicit messages are ones that are subtextual and don't have to really be clearly expressed in order for them to exist. For example, in Attack on Titan, Titan shifters are able to call upon their powers through the use of self-harm. By cutting their finger or biting their hand, they are able to call upon the power of the heavens to vanquish their enemies. Now, explicitly, this tells us that by hurting themselves, they are able to hurt others. A pretty bare bones statement. But that's one that lines up with the themes of the show about ending cycles of violence and hatred. Implicitly, it tells us that self-harm is a valuable tool. Now, Im implicit messages are tricky. Sometimes they are purposely implanted by writers in order to incite audience reaction or action. But sometimes they can just be an oversight by the creator. Like in the example earlier, I don't think that Isayama intended for the implicit message. And in fact, the explicit message is a lot more succinct and lines up with the running themes. But just because it's not what he intended doesn't mean that it also doesn't exist. And just because the explicit message is the author's intent and it fits the story themes better doesn't always mean that the implicit message should be ignored. Lastly, the only thing necessary for an implicit message to be valid is that you can create a logical implication based on the author's material. And in the case of Attack on Titan, there is a clear disconnect between the explicit and the implicit material. So in order to talk about the anti-Semitic nature of the show, I'm going to be splitting this up into two parts. First, I'm going to be talking about the magic system and how it contradicts the main themes of the show. And then second, I'm going to be talking about the allegory for Attack on Titan. In March of 2021, a creator by the name of Just Right made a now deleted video titled Attack on Titan and the Dangers of Allegory. This video has since been removed, but it was met with a lot of negative criticism from fans. JW and I have a similar thesis on Attack on Titan, and I think it's important to frame the conversation of why AOT is anti-Semitic with a video that was received negatively by the fandom. Just Right's central thesis was that, quote, even though the stated themes are against fascism, nationalism, and anti-Semitism, I don't think that Isayama has done enough to close the door on these interpretations. 
And soon after, another creator by the name of Literal Maverick made a response video, refuting many of JW's claims. Now, I think that they both have their faults in their analysis. It's clear that in JW's case, he chose to actively ignore very major plot points and explicit messaging in order to make his points about fascism and nationalism seem more, I guess, correct? In Maverick's case, he was unable to accept JW's very legitimate concerns about AOT, likely due to the fact that he was already combating against very disingenuous conclusions. And while Maverick does a really good job of dismantling many of JW's takes, he does a poor job at understanding the topic of race. Take a look at this clip, for example. The argument that Marley uses against the Eldians, that because they can turn into titans that they are devils and must be eradicated for the greater good, is still an unacceptable one. The argument is not what should matter when it comes to issues of racism. It's the rule that racism is bad, that othering people for things that they can't control is wrong, full stop. Now this is where I feel like Maverick really misses the mark on why racism is bad. Racism isn't just bad because treating others unequally is bad. Racism is bad because it's illogical. And implying that there is a logical reason for hating a group of people, despite how explicit the messaging is, is bad. Full stop. For context, a, a pseudoscience called phrenology was used to argue that black people were genetically predisposed to be slaves. There were ideas of one-drop rules, where having a black ancestor prohibited you from marrying a white person. And now, we know that there is no genetic difference between different races of people. And that's because race is a social construct. It is not an accurate representation of genetic human variation. And this is where Just Right makes a very, very good point that was not well received in his original video. In Attack on Titan, there are explicit differences between different groups of people. The title of Eldian and Subjects of Ymir isn't just a label given to a group of people that are persecuted because of racism. Here, the literal biology of these people are different. And regardless of what the show says explicitly about race, implicitly, it tells us that these differences in people are tangible and rooted in science. Now, to try and make the claim that Isayama and his work are explicitly anti-Semitic would take ignoring the very explicit things that are written in the text. It would go without acknowledging that the Eldians are characters who are victims of racial prejudice and violence, who are protagonists who we empathize with. Not only that, but the mistreatment of Eldians is never presented as justified. But in the same way that someone can be racist without intending to be racist, Isayama made this piece of work that is anti-Semitic. And both the explicit and the implicit messages exist at the same time. And these two things contradict each other. So let's now talk about who the Eldians are an allegory for. Now, later on in the video, I'm gonna be talking about other allegories that exist, but I wanted to address the elephant in the room first. Some people say that the Eldians are a one-to-one -one allegory for the Jews in Nazi Germany. This is not true. I've come to the conclusion that they are a combination of three different groups. First, Jews during Nazi Germany. Second, Japanese Americans during World War II. And finally, Japanese people in the modern day. But when you look at the time period, you look at the fashion choices, you look at the internment zones, the armbands, the religious iconography, and even the music choices, it's hard to deny that the show isn't leaning heavily towards the fact that the Eldians are coded for Jewish people. That doesn't mean that the others aren't there, but that is the one that is most explicitly shown. I'll admit that I might be biased in my conclusion simply for the fact that I'm an American. I, I've grown up learning about the Holocaust and the treatment of Japanese Americans during World War II is not something that we like to talk about here. So it is possible that these allegories were more visible to people who were familiar with the history prior to me viewing it. Now, back to the allegory, I think that Isayama intended to use the armbands to draw out an initial reaction from the audience. But the meaning and implications of these armbands as it relates to the Jewish people in Attack on Titan is problematic. And it doesn't matter whether or not Isayama explicitly says that treating others differently based on their race is bad. And the reason it's problematic is simply because of the magic system. It has to do with something called bloodline. For those of you that don't know, 
as I didn't, because this is actually true, because I didn't know, so I actually should address this, because this is the, I don't know if, blood libel, I don't, I, how common is that? Blood libel is somewhat well known. It is known to anyone that has studied theology, anyone that is obviously Jewish, and you actually already know about it. There are many conspiracy theories about celebrities drinking the blood of children. Oh, like the, pe young. the Pizzagate thing? Yes, Pizzagate is indeed a blood libel anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. The same thing actually goes for lizard people. Any idea that there is someone in the establishment that is cannibalizing children is rooted in anti-Semitism. Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Blood libel is the conspiracy theory that Jewish people use the blood of non-Jewish children, usually Christian children, for ritualistic purposes. In particular, this was the consumption of blood, and it would not just be limited to only children. There are many instances of people coming up with conspiracy theories that have to do with the cannibalization of different priests and prophets. Oh, did I not say consumption? Yeah, you're not they, they would consume the blood. These libels were usually presented close to Passover. And the reason why this rhetoric was more popular during that time was because it associated the Jewish people with the death of Jesus Christ and their quote unquote responsibility in it. Now during Nazi Germany, this led to riots in which Jewish people were wrongfully targeted and it continued to add to the anti-Semitic sentiment during Nazi Germany. So you might be asking, what does this have to do with Attack on Titan? a show about Jewish coded characters that possess powers that are commonly transferable through the consumption of other humans in ritualistic practices. And additionally, these Jewish coded characters are being punished because they were perpetrators of a worldwide genocide. And that's bad. That is very problematic writing. Am I being, am I off base here? No, uh, my own base. That's the plot of Blood Life. That's, that's what happens in the show. At the end of the day, regardless of intent, this plays into an anti Semitic trope. And because the trope exists, and because the explicit text directly counters this implicit message, that means that Attack on Titan is, and only is, implicitly anti Semitic. Now, now, do you remember what I said earlier? Implicit messages are tricky. Sometimes they are purposely implanted by writers in order to incite audience reaction or action. But sometimes they can just be an oversight by the creator. I don't think that Isayama intended for the implicit message. And in fact, the explicit message is a lot more succinct and lines up with the running themes. But just because it's not what he intended doesn't mean that it also doesn't exist. JW says that Isayama was careless in his crafting of Attack on Titan. And if Isayama weren't born in Japan, I might agree. I'm not going to sit here and say conclusively that Isayama is a Nazi, just because there is problematic subtext. I think the more likely answer is that he was ignorant. And not ignorant in a malicious way, ignorant in a more systemic way as a result of government policies in his home country. Now, while this has a chance of clearing his intent, it doesn't change that this implicit message still exists. And what's especially fascinating is that the explicit message and the implicit message contradict each other entirely, which is very unusual. It seems clear that he at least tried to write an anti-racist story. A story about people who try to overcome their past histories and come together to end the cycle of violence and hatred for future generations. But at the same time, the contradiction still exists. The Eldian people are tragic victims of racial violence and prejudice, and there's no reason why these people should be treated differently from others. Except for the fact that their ancestors were responsible in a worldwide campaign of ethnic cleansing that lasted almost 2,000 years. The treatment of Eldians is wrong because they're no different from other people. Except for the fact that they are quite literally genetically predisposed to turn into man-eating monsters. Apart from Isayama's potential ignorance, another reason why the allegory is so muddled is because it pulls from so many different ideas. And if the show would have pulled back on the imagery relating to the Jewish people, and instead focused either solely on race or even the conflict of nations that is pointed towards the end of season four, none of these problems would exist. But because he chose to use the armbands, because there's an anti-Semitic trope, because the arguments for why the Eldians are discriminated against are based in logic, 
unlike how racism in our world is illogical, the allegory for the Eldians in Marley is problematic, to say the least. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other allegory that exists in the show. So we know that the Eldians living in Marley are an allegory for the Jews during World War II, but they're also an allegory for Japanese Americans during the same time period. And to Isayama's credit, everything except for the armbands and the blood libel leans in this direction a lot more favorably. If you're skeptical, consider the following. On December 7th, 1941, Japanese forces in fighter planes attacked Pearl Harbor. And during the attack, almost 20 naval vessels, eight battleships, and 300 airplanes were destroyed. There were also over 2,400 American deaths and 1,000 injured. Now, although this attack was a war crime and a tragic loss of American lives, it is no excuse for the actions that America took following this. Initially after Pearl Harbor, people stood by their fellow Americans. Articles in the Los Angeles Times said that Asian Americans were, quote, good Americans, born and educated as such. But as time went on and skepticism grew, so too did pressure on the administration at the time under FDR. On January 28, 1942, the Roberts Commission was released. It was a report that investigated the attack on Pearl Harbor, among other things. It detailed that the main reason why the attack happened was because of the commanding officers stationed at the base. However, there was one line that was harped on heavily by news sources. The line mentioned spying by, quote, Japanese consular agents and other persons having no open relations with the Japanese Foreign Service. Now, the report didn't make any mention of Japanese Americans, but that really didn't matter. It was enough for media outlets and federal officials to cast doubt on the loyalty of United States citizens. I don't want any of them here. They are a dangerous element. There is no way to determine their loyalty. It makes no difference whether he is an American citizen. He is still a Jap. American citizenship does not necessarily determine loyalty, but we must worry about the Japanese all the time until they're wiped off the map. On February 19, 1942, just two months after Pearl Harbor, FDR signed Executive Order 9066. This gave the acting Secretary of War the power to incarcerate people of Japanese ancestry and use American soil as military zones that housed concentration camps. The total number of Japanese people incarcerated was about 120,000. Two thirds of these people were American. One of the ways that Japanese Americans sought to prove their loyalty was to enlist in the military. And despite this, hate crimes against Japanese Americans in the mid 1900s were rampant. There's a name for children of Japanese immigrants that lived in these internment zones, Nisai. My apologies for pronunciation. There's even a unit of soldiers called the Nisai unit that fought behind enemy lines against Japanese forces, that translated Japanese documents known as the Z Plan that contained Japan's counterattack strategy in the Central Pacific. And they were overall very helpful in winning the war. So you may be asking yourself, how does this relate to the story of Attack on Titan? A group of people in concentration camps who have nothing to do with the atrocities committed by their ancestors, fighting against another group of people who have shared ancestry in order to prove their loyalty to the country who oppresses them. And if we're looking at the allegory of Attack on Titan as it relates to the Japanese Americans during World War II, it does a lot to help clear up Isayama's intent in the story. And although this doesn't help with the implicit message of anti-Semitic tropes, it does help to clear up a lot of the rhetoric that I've seen online that claim that he is a full-blown Nazi. For starters, the atrocities committed by the Eldians read as incredibly insensitive if we think of them as relating to the Jewish people. Because the Jewish people were not responsible for any crimes. The hatred for them was completely illogical. The Jewish people have not been perpetrators of violence, but the country of Japan has. Arriving at a probable number of Japan's war victims who died is difficult for several interesting reasons, which have to do with Western perceptions. Most Americans think of World War II in Asia as having begun with Pearl Harbor. It really began in 1895 with Japan's assassination of Korea's Queen Min and invasion of Korea, resulting in its absorption into Japan, followed quickly by Japan's seizure of Southern Manchuria. Therefore, Rummel's estimate of 6 million to 10 million dead between 1937 and 1945 may be roughly corollary to the time frame of the Nazi Holocaust, but it falls far short of the actual numbers killed by the Japanese war machine. If you add, say, 2 million Koreans, 
2 million Manchurians, Chinese, Russians, many East European Jews, and others killed by Japan during 1895 and 1937, the total of Japanese victims is more like 10 million to 14 million. The level of devastation committed by Japan is comparable to that of the Nazis during the same time period. But what's troubling in Japan's case is their commitment to spreading a revisionist history that paints them in a more sympathetic light and absolve them of their crimes. As early as 2015, Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has gone on record rejecting American textbooks that criticize Japan for the crimes that they committed. As a result, Japanese people can be unaware of the extent of their nation's colonialism and imperialism. So you may be asking yourself, how does that relate to Attack on Titan? Well, a civilization on an island whose government is actively suppressing the true nature of the country's history, that history involving conquest, bloodshed, and racism. And I do want to make it very clear. Just because this may have been Isayama's intent doesn't mean that the other allegory for the Jewish people doesn't exist, and it doesn't mean that it should be ignored. So, in making this video, talking about the show on the podcast that we have on our channel, editing a reaction series for another channel, and reading the manga, enveloping myself in the discourse surrounding the show, it was articles like these that I hated the most. Articles that gloss over relevant world history to create an easy narrative. And, and, and that's the word that I really want to hone in on. Easy. For people who are staunch defenders of AOT, it's hard to reconcile with the fact that the show isn't perfect. And for people who already hate the show, it could be hard to reconcile with the fact that the show isn't all bad. But after thinking about the show, thinking about the manga and everything else for what seems to be now a year, I have come to one major conclusion. Isayama is an inexperienced writer. For one, Attack on Titan is his first story. His first story, not published story, his first story. Again, he may have written some stuff when he was a kid, but this is the first piece of work that he has put out into the world. And second, I think that all the contradictions that I talked about in this video wouldn't have existed if Isayama had a few more writing credits under his belt. Plus, I didn't even get to talk about all of the weird inconsistencies of the show. Like the premonition that's in the beginning of season one. It's actually just a bunch of shots of Hornet on an eyeball and then like dolls on a cabinet. And it's like, oh, these might be the Tiber family, but like really. And then there's the whole thing of the shot of the key in season one. But in the manga, it was a shot of a full shot of Grisha looking at nothing so that Grisha would actually be looking at future Eren. But if Isayama was actually in charge of writing the anime, you know, it's like, why would you purposefully not put that there in a thing that you're adapting if you knew that the thing was gonna happen later on. Oh, and don't, e don't even get me started on Mikasa's, Mikasa's tattoo, or should I say crochet pattern. You were in charge of the anime. You were, you were there. And then there's the whole Berserk Titan. You remember the Berserk Titan? Plus there's King Fritz's whole plan, all right? This whole thing makes no fucking sense. Because if you wanted to create a perfect society in which nobody could escape or learn about the thing, why wouldn't you control more than one branch of your fucking military? So there's a lot of problems. Okay, look, so I think that Isayama had some things planned. I think that he knew that there was a world outside the walls, and I think that he planned to have the world be ruled by a fascist empire. He knew that Reiner, Annie, and Berthold were the shifters in disguise. He knew that Aaron's dad was a titan shifter who came from outside, and he absolutely knew that there were elements of time travel in the story. And he absolutely planned for Aaron's villainous ending at the end of season four. But I don't think he knew for sure that the Eldians were going to be used to discuss the very complex topic of race. I don't think that he knew for sure if Grisha was going to be looking at Eren in chapter one. I don't think he knew for sure that Mikasa's tattoo or crochet pattern would be impactful to the story later on in the future. And I don't think he's at fault for that necessarily. I mean, it's his first piece of work. Apart from a one-shot that he made in the 2000s, this is the only story that he has actively tried to publish. So with all of these faults considered, it's amazing that this thing makes as much sense as it does. There were a lot of things in Attack on Titan that are cool because Isayama planned for it. But not everything was planned. And that's fine. But just because we love Attack on Titan doesn't mean that it's perfect. But just because something isn't perfect 
doesn't mean that it isn't good. An attack on Titan is good. It's just anti-Semitic. So you've made it to the end of the video. This has been our first true video essay on the channel. If you like this and you want to see more of our in-depth Attack on Titan coverage, check out our podcast over somewhere in the corners of the screen on the end cards. We also got a full stop review for a fan fiction of Attack on Titan called Attack on Titan No Requiem. Uh, and leave us suggestions for what you think we should cover in the next, uh, uh, God, the next Looking Glass. God, we need a teleprompter so bad. <laughs>